Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar, Being Cool Has Never Been So Hot, Climate Action for Resilient Livelihoods. First of all, we would like to thank you for joining us today. We really appreciate your interest to learn and exchange with us on such an important topic. My name is Gabriela Tigum, and I am the Communication and Marketing Specialist for Hans Reynolds Stiftung in Central America. So as many of you know, Climate change is impacting and will continue to threaten coffee production in smallholder communities for years to come. As these effects become worse throughout the years, one thing is for certain, the challenge is too big to manage it alone. For today's webinar, we will be discussing the importance of coffee sector's involvement in addressing these challenges and establishing climate resilient livelihoods for smallholder families. We will also learn more about the new phase of the Initiative for Coffee and Climate, also known as CNC, and how this program will continue to provide training, access to appropriate methods, and know-how on climate smart agriculture to ensure that smallholder families um, and entire communities are adapting properly. I am really excited to bring together a group of industry partners from around the world for a very interesting panelist discussion, and I would like to introduce them to you. Joining us today is Veronica Rossi, Sustainability Manager at Lavazza Foundation. Hello, Veronica. Hello, good morning from Italy. We have Cecilia Brumer, Program Specialist at the Swedish Development Agency, also known as CIDA. Hello, glad to be here. Hi, Cecilia. Dulce Posadas, a smallholder farmer joining us all the way from Copan, Honduras. Hello, thank you for having me here. I'm so happy to share this time with you. Thank you, Ulsa. And Stefan Ruge, Program Manager of the Initiative for Coffee and Climate at Hans Neumann Stiftung in Hamburg. Hello, Gabi. Hello from Hamburg. Veronica, Cecilia, Dulce, and Stefan, it is absolutely wonderful to have you. We are looking forward to a great discussion with you today. Thank you for joining. And before we begin, I would like to go over some quick notes regarding questions. So please feel free to send in your questions directly to the panelists using the chat box found at the lower right hand corner. We will be addressing your questions at the very end of the webinar. So go ahead and write your questions as they come up. We really look forward to answering them. And to get right into the topic, we'd like to hear from all of you joining us today. We have two questions set up. We're going to ask Yesco, okay, I think everybody can see the polls. How much area of coffee production is projected to be lost in Honduras by 2050 due to climate change? Is it 5%, 20%, 35% or more than 40%? And we'd also like to ask you the same for Uganda. How much area of coffee production do you think will be lost? 30%, 50%, 65% or more than 70? And make sure to scroll down to view all of the answer options, please. We're just gonna give you all a couple more seconds while answers come in. Thank you for answering. Yeah, and I think everyone has pretty much answered. So we're just going to ask Yesco to please go ahead and stop the poll. And we will be sharing results shortly. Thank you, Yesco. I now like to hand it over to Stefan, who will be giving us an overview about the initiative for coffee and climate and what has been achieved throughout the two, two, the first two phases of implementation. Stefan, the floor is yours. Thank you, Gabi, for the great opening words. Um, the initiative for coffee and climate, um, please next slide, was founded in 2010 as an open pre-competitive partnership of coffee companies and development organizations with the objective to provide coffee smallholder families around the world with the tools and with the knowledge to adapt their production systems to the impacts of climate change. And climate change is such an enormous challenge that a single company would not have the necessary financial capacities or the knowledge to act effectively alone. 
issues like increasing deforestation rates in coffee sourcing regions are issues for all companies. Therefore, it makes so much sense to work together and bundle resources. Therefore, I would like to highlight once again the pre-competitive character of our initiatives. Our members from the private sector and public sector cooperate together within coffee and climate and contribute their knowledge for a continuous development of relevant climate knowledge for the coffee sector. Next slide, please. <clears throat> and the impacts of climate change differ from region to region and sometimes even from village to village. For example, you can find a coffee farm in Uganda that is affected by hailstorm, while the neighboring farm, maybe just one kilometer away, can be affected by drought. Therefore, we need to know for each specific location what are the best climate adaptation strategies and practices. And the core element of our work is here our coffee and climate approach which represents a systematic approach by not providing a single set of answers, but instead information, concepts, and tools to support the development of locally appropriate climate adaptation and mitigation measures. And because of that, one component of our work is the continuous identification and evaluation of climate knowledge in all our program regions, including how climate action can be incorporated into a broader livelihood approach. But as Coffee and Climate, we are aware that the biggest challenge is actually not generating knowledge, but how to provide farming families, even in the most remote areas, with this knowledge. Therefore, another component of Coffee and Climate is to provide training to coffee smallholder families on climate adaptation and mitigation, either via direct training through our own agronomist or by training extension staff of third parties. And we also know that because climate change is such a complex issue that we need to encourage learning and exchange of experiences with other partners. Therefore, all generated knowledge within coffee and climate is a public good and we share it with the sector, for example, via our Coffee and Climate Toolbox and online library. <clears throat> and the work of Coffee and Climate is much more than just focusing on climate smart agriculture. It is about establishing climate resilient livelihoods and with that resilient coffee supply chains. Therefore, our training also includes topics like promoting climate action as a family business. Adapting a coffee smallholder farm to the impacts of climate change is an enormous task that takes an effort from the entire family and all family members need to benefit equally. And that is one of the many reasons why within coffee and climate, gender equality is mainstreamed in all our interventions. Another focus area is to enable young people to become an active part of our climate work. For us, these young people in coffee regions are actually the real door openers for new innovations, be it on their farms, within their farm organizations or communities, through introduction of new cultivation methods, or for example, the use of digital solutions. And what makes Coffee and Climate so special for me personally is that we do not only organize great meetings and great webinars and roundtables, which of course are also important, but the core focus of Coffee and Climate is really direct climate action in our program regions to support coffee smallholder families, their organizations, and communities. Until November 2020, we reached over 92,000 coffee families with training to improve their climate resilience, plus 9,000 families with a special gender focus. And in general, our program families are more resilient to the impacts of climate change than non-program families and are therefore also stronger supply chain partners for the industry. And all of our work is evaluated by independent third parties. So as coffee and climate, what we claim, we can also prove. And now I would like to hand over to Gabi again to show us the power results. Thank you so much, Stefan. Um, it's really interesting to know what CNC has achieved so far, but I think what's even more exciting is getting to know all of the work that lies ahead, especially with phase three of coffee and climate just starting. So before you tell us all about it, why don't you show the full results and maybe you can comment on why these projections are so important when coming into the new phase. Yes, thank you, Gabi. So we can see that the majority of our participants have selected the right answer. 
If we go to the next slide, please. Um, about 45% in Honduras and about 30% in Uganda of area that is potentially suitable under current conditions will become unsuitable for coffee production until 2050. And the two maps here illustrate this dramatic situation once again. Red are the areas that are likely to be lost to the coffee sector and yellow are areas that can still be saved if we act now. And we could show these maps for all coffee countries, also for the big players like Brazil, Colombia or Vietnam. So it's not a single phenomenon, it's really a trend. And next slide, please. And aware of these challenges, and because we don't have any more time to lose, we have developed the third program phase of coffee and climate, which will run from 2020 to 2024 and should reach at least 80,000 additional coffee families in our program regions with training to establish climate resilient coffee production systems and livelihoods. In phase three, our focus countries are Guatemala, Honduras, Brazil, Ethiopia, Uganda, Tanzania, and Indonesia. And in order to support coffee smallholder families and their communities to become climate resilient, restore and protect coffee landscapes and address the livelihood situation, in phase three, coffee and climate focuses on three main areas. Under coffee and climate innovation, we aim to continuously identify and evaluate climate knowledge in all of our program regions. This includes, among other things, the further development of coffee production systems. How should a coffee farm actually look like in 2021? And this includes more than just focusing on productivity and quality, which are, of course, important indicators, but for example, also the promotion and establishment of agroforestry production systems, or focusing on food security, income diversification, or using organic waste on a coffee farm as an important resource, rather than just seeing it as a waste product. We also want to evaluate the use of digital solutions to improve the decision-making process of coffee smallholder families regarding climate change adaptation and mitigation, but also how can we use these tools to provide training and knowledge to coffee farming families. And despite agroforestry's advantages, right now, smallholder coffee families do not receive an incentive for maintaining these systems, although they contribute significantly to the storage and long-term systematic sequestration of CO2. Therefore, under coffee and climate innovation, we will develop, test, and evaluate a framework for carbon accounting, recognizing the environmental services of diversified coffee production systems and landscapes. And also, this framework should serve as, a, as, a, as, a, as a, um, another financial income source for farming families. And it will also meet the demand of the industry for establishing carbon neutral supply chains. Under coffee and climate implementation, the knowledge and approaches that are generated under innovation are transferred directly to our program beneficiaries via direct training. At the same time, our training focuses on a broader livelihood approach. This includes farming as a family business, transient local farm organizations, empowering the next generation and mainstreaming gender equality. We have also developed the vision of a climate smart coffee region. How can we implement a systematic approach, a systematic framework to make an entire coffee growing region more climate resilient? And under coffee and climate dissemination, it's all about sharing the knowledge and experiences developed within the initiative with the sector as a public good. For this, we have established the coffee and climate toolbox, an online library, and in all of our program regions, we will also set up communities of practice composed of representatives of farm organizations from trading houses, government, NGOs, and research to share learnings and to share experience together. And we also offer training of training opportunities to interested third parties so that they can implement the knowledge of coffee and climate into their own organizations and structures. And with that, I would like to hand over to Gabi again. 
Thank you for this overview, Stefan. Um, we will now transition and begin with our panelist discussion. The panelist discussion is divided in three parts. Part one will address the impacts of climate change on coffee production and farmer livelihoods. In part two, questions will focus on how to establish climate resilient livelihoods and landscapes in a collaborative way. And to end the discussion, we will talk about the role of coffee and climate as part of the solution. I'd like to welcome our panelists and let's get started. Hi, everyone. Can I please ask you to put your cameras on? Thank you so much, and we will get started. So we hear about climate change and its negative impacts on coffee production, but how do smallholder families and their communities truly experience these impacts? Dulce, as a second generation smallholder coffee farmer from Honduras, how have you experienced these impacts? Hello, climate change was something that was really not talked uh, about past generations, right? But today is a challenge and it's a really faced by smallholders in my community, including myself. The impacts I've experienced include climate variability, very drastic changes in temperature, increased pests and disease in crops, hurricanes and winds, strong winds. And as a result, my production has reduced. I've experienced early blooms or late harvest and, it, and the quality of my coffee has been affected. Thank you, Dulce. Um, Veronica, now that we've heard about Dulce's experience facing climate impacts, how would you say that La Vazza is assessing the risk of climate change in your coffee sourcing operations? Well, uh, first of all, again, thank you for having me here. Um, I am working in, in the Lavazza Sustainability Department, but I'm also working for Lavazza Foundation, so I have a double hat here today. And um, well, in Lavazza, we have been working on assessing environmental risks in general and climate change specifically for many years. And especially in our sustainability department, we have a dedicated unit focusing on environmental sustainability with uh, specialists, engineers, working with us and for us, assessing the environmental risks along the supply chain. Climate change is just one of the risks that we assess because we also have uh, all the risk related to CO2 emissions, to water impacts, to soil degradation, and to toxicity. So there are many parameters. Of course, climate change is also an umbrella for all of this, but uh, it's really important for um, a company like ours dealing with a commodity like coffee, which is so much impacted by climate change, to monitor all the parameters. And to do this, um, collaboration with the supply chain actors, especially our uh, suppliers, is fundamental because they are the one owning data, owning information, and having the direct uh, contact with the field is really key. So what I can say uh, is that especially in the last years, we have been focusing very much on uh, working on primary data together with our suppliers because it's a mutual exchange and, and also it can generate mutual um, support. This for the, uh, for, for, for the company, we also again monitor, but not just monitor, we also of course, uh, develop specific programs to, uh, to deal with this great challenge. On the Lavazza Foundation side, so with my Lavazza Foundation hat, I can say that we have been working on climate change since uh, even before we were born, because actually Lavazza has been joining IECP in 2001 and Lavazza Foundation was established in 2004. And we were among the founders of, of uh, Coffee and Climate. So this is something that as a foundation, we have been working very much for, for many years. And in the last years, we have been focusing very much on issues like uh, deforestation in, in, in coffee areas, uh, forest degradation, and of course, conservation projects, because this is really becoming um, the, the, the key challenge from which many other challenges are generating also the social ones. But we will have the time to, to talk afterwards about that. Thank you, Veronica. Cecilia, I'd like to hear what your take on this topic is as well. We know that for CEDA, climate change is an important part of your work to support smallholder families around the world. 
Um, but when working to address climate change, where do you see the biggest challenge in making sure that smallholders are achieving prosperous livelihoods? Thank you, Gabriella. Uh, yes, the Swedish government and CEDA uh, values work within climate change uh, as a basis for development. But just let me relate also to a bigger actor, which is the World Economic Forum, uh, which we all relate to somehow. They each year they identify the top global risks, uh, both by likelihood and by impact. And in the, the report for 2021, the climate action failure is rated number two both uh, for likelihood and for impact. And then we have all risks related to, to smallholder farmers in other ways, like natural resource crisis, biodiversity loss, and extreme weather uh, conditions. Um, so those are global risks for, for both the planet and humanity. Uh, and these risks are real, and even though they affect us all, they affect uh, smallholder farmers living in poverty, they are among the hardest hit. Um, they depend on the natural resources in a direct way. And uh, with climate change, the opportunities to use these natural resources are seriously compromised. Uh, so climate change causes these extreme weather as floods and droughts, rising temperatures, bring more pests and diseases. You also know all about this much better than I do diseases to both plants and animals. Uh, so hence whole, whole harvests or livestock herds might be affected. Uh, and smallholder farmers have very small margins. Uh, so the, also the predicted pattern that farmers used to have when to plant, when to water and nourish, when to harvest, everything is new now. Everything has changed. You might have had one season, uh, one harvest. Uh, now there's two, but they're bad. Or do you have had different patterns have changed. Uh, and all these patterns, uh, you need new risk strategies. Uh, and how do you, how do you, how do we help to equip each other with these risk strategies, like Veronica talked about? Uh, so, um, I think uh, for us, new knowledge uh, on climate smart agriculture and climate adaptation, like this one in coffee and climate, must be created, shared, and used by smallholder farmers. Thank you, Cecilia. So now that we've heard from different perspectives that climate change is putting the livelihood of farmer families at risk and ultimately our cup of morning coffee, the question now becomes what should be done to achieve this and to change this. So Veronica and Cecilia, in the last 20 years, since the last big coffee crisis, lots of money has been invested into coffee sustainability. And yet this year in 2021, poverty rates are increasing in coffee communities, people are abandoning production. And as we've seen, we are at risk at losing entire coffee sourcing regions. So in your opinion, what went wrong and what needs to change? Veronica, I'll let you go ahead and start first. Well, uh, I think that in the last uh, 10 years, 15 years, climate change has accelerated very much the, the crisis of the sector, because as Dulce were saying, uh, new pests and disease uh, are, are coming up and, and farmers are not ready to, to face it. We are not ready as an industry to face it. And also these brings to uh, a lower productivity, a lower quality. And so if I don't have enough production, enough quality. I, I don't see any profits coming from coffee. So I abandoned coffee. That's the most logic and right decision that a farmer can, can take in this. So I think that um, what went wrong, that that's a big one. And I think that we probably miss the, 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 the right challenge to, to face as an industry. Uh, and probably we didn't um, concentrated the resources in, in the right way and in, in, in a coordinated way. Uh, we have a problem in coffee, and also the coffee, but the last coffee barometer said that, uh, which was issued a couple of months ago, many multi-stakeholder initiatives are not facing the big challenges of the coffee sector in, a, in, in the right way, in a, in a coordinated way, then in a, you know, um, focused way. So what I think should be done is really focusing on the on the main challenge that in my opinion, personal opinion is climate change because 
climate change is the, the, the challenge of the industry and has many uh, consequences, especially on the social side, which are, again, uh, um, uh, having their impacts on profitability, which is the key for farmers. And, and I see Dulce is, is smiling. So probably she, she agrees with me. If you're not profitable, you cannot, you, you, you have the right to abandon coffee. So this is all interlinked. It's so much interlinked and we really need to focus, in my opinion, as an industry, uh, cooperation and development agencies like CEDA, big companies like Lavazza, the traders who are the ones having so much um, uh, link with the fields and farmers, they need to be part of the game. And coffee and climate, in my opinion, is a good example. Again, we will talk about that in, in, in during the panel about farmers need to be at the center and they, they need to be with us in the solution definition and implementation because they are the one on the field. So um, it's a big discussion. We, I think we, we would need one day just to focus on what went wrong. But uh, yeah, that's my a bit personal view on that. Thank you, Veronica. Cecilia, would you agree? Or what are your thoughts? I would, uh, I would agree with Veronica. Uh, let's just say that even though you say, Gabriela, that many, much has been invested, uh, eh, there are many actors. We are researchers, we are governments, we are uh, companies, we are farmers, and everyone needs to invest in sustainability. Every one of these actors. Uh, and uh, there is sustainability in landscape management, in soil management, water management, trees, coffee plants. But there's also, like Veronica said, uh, uh, sustainability of business models for farmers and for companies. Uh, they need to be sustainable in so many ways and uh, even though you make a big investment as one of these actors and do not cooperate uh, we don't uh, achieve what we want and that has probably not been the case uh, exactly what just as uh, Veronica said that uh, cooperation has not been strong enough uh, or and the co or coordinated enough uh, so all actors possess different kind of knowledge and uh, we need to, to collaborate to take advantage of all that knowledge. Not only the investment made in time and money, but also the knowledge uh, that we all possess. And we need to have different for us to share that with. So yes, more co coordination and, and collaboration. And if I'm, Go ahead. If I, if, if I may, Gabi, I would just like to, um, to add what Veronica was saying about profit. Today in the morning, I bought my uh, coffee from a local roaster here in Hamburg. They only say specialty coffee. And I was asking the guy, okay, how do you define specialty coffee actually? And for him, it was only, you know, high quality and single origin. But for me, specialty coffee is actually coffee that also contributes to the local community, contributes to adaptation mitigation to climate change. So how can we bring a price to, um, climate work from smaller families. So it's really an incentive for them to maintain local forest areas or to do all the hard work on their farms. And here, I think we also need a mindset, a change of mindset in the, in the industry, in the in our coffee world. Thank you, Stefan. Um, yeah, we, I know there's a lot of inputs and a lot of thoughts. So thank you all for your comments. Um, we want to ask our audience what they think as well. We have one question set up. So as part of the coffee sector, you've all mentioned that we want smallholder families to be equipped with the correct knowledge to adapt and mitigate the effects of climate change. We'd like to ask our attendees to answer the following question. What do you think smallholder production systems of the future should look like and focus on? Should they focus on agroforestry systems rather than monoculture systems, focus on different income sources, high quality productivity and quality, focus on food security or farming as a family business, or should they be focused on all five? We're going to give everybody a couple of more minutes. And Yesco, when you're ready, let's go ahead please and show the poll results. Stefan, I'd also like you, um, why don't you go ahead and tell us how should smallholder production systems look like? Um, we cannot see the results yet, Yesco. Yes, 
<clears throat> there we go. Thank you so much. Um, Stefan, what are your thoughts? How should production systems of the future look like? Yeah, thank you, Gabi. I mean, it's also a broad question, which we could fulfill an entire webinar probably. But I think that these, these systems should not only be resilient to climate change, to the impacts of climate change, but also improve the overall life use situation of small loader coffee families. And for that, we need a holistic approach, including farm management, household management, and management of natural resources. And um, just last week, I was reading a new study from the UN saying that we only have around 55 crop cycles left until the soils on Earth will be depleted. And at the same time, the amount of greenhouse gases already emitted it is enough to cause the global warming, global climate to warm up further. And in addition to adapting to climate change, it is important to limit the global warming to below two degrees Celsius as, envis as envisaged in the Paris Agreement. And around only 720 billion tons of CO2 may be emitted for this worldwide. And I think currently we already emit 40 billion tons every year. So that means that the budget we have will be consumed within the next 20 years. And therefore, I strongly believe that we need to start to see, perceive smallholder production systems as part of the solution. When we talk about mitigation projects, I always hear about, let's plant 100 hectare of forest area. And I think it's great, but only thinking about coffee, we have more than 30 million smallholder families in, around the world producing coffee that could be part of the solution to reach the Paris Agreement through good soil management, better processing, establishing of agroforestry production systems, or protecting local forest areas. And that is just the farm management aspect. But in my opinion, strong climate action also needs a strong and healthy family as well. Before the COVID-19 outbreak, um, I could visit a project farm in Uganda where the project family, after one year joining Coffee and Climate, they could increase their income by 100%. And as a program manager, you are proud and you say, therefore, I'm working for, for Coffee and Climate. I put all my heart and soul into this foundation. But the consequence was that this farmer wanted to look for another wife because he said, you know, I have more income, so I could afford another house, so I could afford another wife. So we need a strong gender component here, for example. And because we have that within coffee and climate, within our foundation, we could um, talk to the family so they agreed to work together as a family. Or I also went before COVID to Honduras, to the um, place where the caravan started towards the United States. And many people joining the caravan were coffee families. And we met with young people in one of our program cooperatives where we set up a youth committee. And these young people, they were saying that when they think or when they know that we in Hamburg or in London or in Stockholm or in Italy or wherever enjoy a good coffee from Honduras, it makes them so proud. But at the same time, because of low prices, but also because of climate change impact, it gets every time harder and harder. And they don't want to join this caravan to water in States. They want to stay in their region and their community and yeah, make it stronger. So we need a holistic approach and not just focusing on a single component. Thank you, Stefan. Veronica, um, I'd like to hear from you. What are your thoughts? Would you agree with Stefan? Do you have something to add? Yeah, no, I, I totally agree with him. Actually, I have um, nothing, nothing special to have to add. Just one, uh, one thought. This is something I've been reflecting very much in this year of pandemic, uh, which is the uh, we need to find a way to 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 provide farmers with access to technology, because we saw also in our projects that how how difficult it was without you know the 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 personal technical assistance that we that we provide in person on site and with the social distances di di distancing this has been a challenge for all our projects this year so i think that one um key elements we should reflect on on the on the on the path in the fight to climate change because this is a war in my opinion it's also using all the the weapons we we, we can and access to technology for farmers is one of this it's costly i know it's complicated but it's the future and we saw how much you know a pandemic which we thought it was just you know a virus very far from us not impacting anyone 
had completely changed our lives and we we are here today because of technology and Dulce is here today because of technology. So think how, how uh, revolutionary it could be to Im implement the, the technological component in every sustainability project. I think this is um, a take home I want to, to, to give to all the audience to, to think about. We need to integrate technology, especially when it's so difficult, like in rural context, we need to invest uh, also in, in this area, because otherwise these disruptions that can happen, like we saw in our lives in just a couple of weeks, can really um, um, jeopardize the work we have been doing for years. So yeah, just this point of technology for, for reflection. Thank you, Veronica. And now, now that you mentioned technology, technology and these tools that we need to equip farmers with, we had a question from our audience coming in right now, and I'd like to ask Stefan about it and see what he thinks. How will CNC make this possible? How will CNC provide access to these new tools in a collaborative way to these smallholder farming families? When access to digital solutions? Yes, technology. Yes. Digital. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So in all of our program regions and all of the seven countries, we will assess what digital solutions are existing already, which apps are existing, which kind of platforms are existing, and we will evaluate how we can make best use of these solutions to improve the decision-making process of farming families or use it for training activities. So really starting by an assessment, what is there already, and then trying to identify which of these tools can be best used and utilized. And I just want to highlight what Veronica was saying, that also digital solutions is also a way to make agriculture attractive for the next generation, right? Because they want to use smartphones, they want to use data for improving their farm management. It's a great combination, actually. Thank you, Stefan. Cecilia, would you like to add something quickly? Yes, I just uh, saying that uh, diversification is key. Uh, it's uh, well, agroforestry is great. Uh, all systems that are more holistic than monocropping uh, are, are much better. They're better for the soils, they're better for resilience, uh, and they are better for production and productivity. But you need to be think about being a farmer. Where Dulce is the farmer here, and she knows that there are so many risks to balance, and you need to have an income. Uh, so if you put everything on just just coffee and that fails, that, that is devastating. So you need to have diversification strategies as a risk strategy. So I would say that uh, that is the, the biggest uh, issue for me, diversification. The second one, farming as, as, a, as a family uh, and taking for, uh, as a family business, involving all the family members, as Stefan said, uh, is key for development, overall development, increasing gender equality and involving the youth uh, that we must focus on. And let me just highlight the aspect of gender equality, what Cecilia was mentioning, because climate change is increasing the gap between men and women. If there is a trout, who will go to the next well to get the water? Probably the woman. So the work burden is increasing more for women than for men. So it's therefore you need this holistic approach and not just focusing on economy or one single component, in my opinion. Thank you, Stefan. As we move into the third part of our discussion, we've learned firsthand from Dulce what the current reality of farmers is in her community. Um, and if we don't want to lose important growing regions, then we must act and should and not wait any longer. Veronica, who is responsible for supporting farming families and their communities to address climate change? The industry wants to keep coffee coming in, so why don't they take care of it by themselves? We are, all, we are all responsible for, for our morning coffee, I would say. And um, uh, what I think is that, um, especially on climate change, this is systemic, this is a systemic um, challenge, emergency, not challenge. We, we, we are heading through, towards an emergency, no more just a challenge. Uh, and I think everybody should play its own part in, in this, uh, Dulce has a responsibility as a farmer to treat her coffee in the best way she can and to uh, apply all the, the adaptation measures that uh, coffee and climate has been providing her through the pro program. Um, a roaster company like Lavazza has the responsibility to source 
this coffee in a sustainable way and to be part of an initiative like Coffee and Climate. Uh, Cecilia, representing a cooperation agency, has the responsibility to stay on, on, on the programs, to provide resources for the program and to provide expertise. So Stefan has his role in you know, implementing the program. So I think this is a puzzle. Without a piece of the puzzle, we don't have the full image and the full nice picture we can put on our walls. So everybody should play a part on that, according, of course, to the different capacities, but everybody should take care of our morning coffee. Thank you, Veronica. Dulce, I'd like to hand it over to you and I'd like to hear what your thoughts on this topic is. What role should everybody play in this? Yes, as uh, Veronica said, we all have part. We all have a responsibility to produce and to apart to apart, right, to the climate change changes. Thank you, Dulce. And to follow up on that question, Veronica, um, we know that Lavazza is leading coffee is a leading coffee company, and Sira has a long legacy in development work. Why have you believed in coffee and climate for so many years? We'll give you just a couple of seconds to answer Veronica and then I would hand it over to Cecilia so she can share her thoughts. Well, uh, I was not there when we joined, actually when we found Coffee and Climate um, at the time, but I know that the company has been um, believing not just in Coffee and Climate as an idea, but as Coffee and Climate as a methodology because it was the, one of the first examples of pre-competitive alliances uh, together with other roasters and together with other act actors. And um, it was uh, based on scientific evidence. We are all work, talking so much on these days about scientific evidence. And that was the beginning of coffee and climate study. Let's study coffee. And what, what is the relationship between coffee and climate change? And based on the studies, let's try to find solutions. So I think that the methodology was the thing that made Lavazza being so confident about this program. Thank you, Veronica. Cecilia? Okay, let's face it that the, the uh, development agencies, the development assistance uh, in the world, uh, Sweden is a small country, uh, we are committed to development uh, uh, and we have some money for that, but there's no way that our money or that the combined uh, official development uh, money in the world will uh, help achieve the 17 very ambitious uh, global goals that were set in 2015. Uh, therefore, I would say that the private sector is key. Uh, we need both the money uh, the, and most of all the long-term commitment uh, and all the what we have talked about, the knowledge, the, the experience, the networks. Um, so we need each other uh, to, to create this, uh, this development, to achieve this development. Um, and I would say that Coffee and Climate is such a partnership uh, that we, we see commitment from all these partners, just as Veronica said, uh, and willingness to invest in long-term sustainable uh, development in this particular sector. Uh, and then we are contributing to improving the livelihoods of smallholder families um, and hopefully also inspiring others to do similar partnerships, because I think this is a, this is a great model uh, that I hope others will, will be inspired by and copy. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And Dulce, you've participated in coffee and climate trainings for the last two phases. So what would you say uh, makes coffee and climate different to other programs that are climate related? Okay, coffee and climate is different because it has provided with uh, the tools, the knowledge, and also the technical assistance uh, that we need to adapt to this climate change, right? And it's focused, uh, as um, Cecilia said, on long-term adoption, the impact. Stefan, what would you say? How is coffee and climate ensuring that climate action is actually being made and actually benefiting smallholder families in the long run? Mm. Well, during the last 10 years as Coffee and Climate, we have established strong and reliable networks in our program countries with on the ground working experiences as Dulce just mentioned, with different stakeholders, farming families, local government, 
industry development agencies. And because our initiative is long-term oriented and not just a project that ends after some years, we have gained the trust of these local partners through our consistent work and our aim to establish long-term cooperation with them. And therefore, our initiative with Hansa Neumann Stiftung as implementing agent, we are deeply rooted in our program regions. And our staff, and you know it better than I do, is often being a part of the family, being part, they are friends of the local communities. And therefore, our climate action is not just implementing activities. It has become, in a lot of regions, actually part of the daily life of these communities. And the trust that the people in the program regions have in us and that we have built up together with them over a long period of time also means that we are responsible for keeping it, right? And, you know, in my work before joining Coffee and Climate, I worked in Latin America and I saw it so often that many coffee smallholder families are often so disappointed with short projects because often these projects promise a lot, but then after two or three years, they end. And then there is no impact left because there's no more money for that. And then these families and communities are left alone again. And therefore for us as Coffee and Climate, having gained this trust of coffee families, the organizations, local government, we do not take this for granted. And therefore we do our best to provide also the best possible service to these families and communities. And as Veronica was mentioning, we are following a systematic approach, bottom up, with well-informed action in the field by starting with a risk analysis, a vulnerability assessment, identification of best options, et cetera, and creating impact with the producers and also sharing the knowledge, sharing the impact with local stakeholders, for example, through the establishment of committees of practice. And all the consolidated information knowledge is discussed and evaluated within our expert committee of coffee and climate or through our steering committee. So we have our own steering committee composed of the members from the private and sector, uh, private and public sector, where we are also responsible in front of our donors. And therefore all our project, our work is also evaluated by third parties. So we also have to yeah, respond in front of the donors from the private and public sector. Thank you, Stefan. We have a lot of questions coming in from our audience. So we want to make sure that we are not taking too long. Dulce, we had a question coming, coming up directed to you and we'd like to ask you, how do you see the future of youth in coffee in Central America specifically? Sorry. <laughs> Hello, as a, a young people and a woman into the, the this uh, world of coffee, uh, as young people, we have to adapt, right? First, to all these changes that is uh, we, uh, face in coffee uh, productions, right? Because as Cecilia and Veronica said, we face now new things and we have to adapt and we have to study. We have to, to look for, uh, for, other, um, for other tools or other uh, things, other, um, I don't know how to say the other uh, ways, right? to produce and, and uh, learn to our fathers, to our, uh, these uh, people that we can produce, diversifying the, the farmers and not only produce coffee, I think. And that this will help youth in the long run stay in agriculture and focus if they are able to explore and find new opportunities with coffee. Um, thank you, Dulce. Um, thank you for a great discussion. We are getting close with time and we do have lots of questions coming in. So we want to go ahead and make sure that we at least have a couple of questions to answer. Um, I'd like to start with this one. The sector currently discusses a lot about sustainability efforts falling short. How do we make sure that CNC is just another, not just not another round table, Stefan? Well, um, as, I, as I mentioned that for us, CNC is, work, is really action-driven work. So having roundtables and webinars, yeah, it is important, but the core work of CNC is the direct action in the field. Therefore, in all of our program countries, we have own agronomists, own staff to train directly smallholder families or farm organizations, or we also offer training of trainer opportunities. So it's about working and being in the field and doing climate actions there. 
Thank you, Stefan. And how is CNC ensuring that work is really happening together in a collaborative way? So in our program regions, we have, for example, the communities of practice, which are composed of different relevant local stakeholders. We also have other platforms like our expert committee. We have the Coffee and Climate Steering Committee. And within Coffee and Climate Dissemination, we encourage the learning and change with other knowledge partners, which have complementary approaches. So we can check if we can strengthen our climate work together by combined, combining different approaches here. Thank you, Stefan. Um, Cecilia, I have a question for you. Where do you see the value of bringing together public and private actors through this partnership to support farmers and strengthen their capacity to deal with climate impacts? We are a development agency. Uh, we are not coffee uh, experts, all of us. We are not uh, value chain uh, coffee experts. We are not traders. Uh, we know a lot of, of, uh, in, in, of the world of, of coffee production and agriculture, but uh, we believe that the coffee companies and the coffee producers, uh, such as Dulce and, and her fellows, uh, know much more and, and can collab and can, can gain that, uh, can, can bring that knowledge to us. Uh, we, uh, uh, are active in the dialogue and we also have as the implementing part here, which, which is HR and NS, which you are also very, very knowledgeable, but you and you're, you're facilitating us uh, in a good way to bring out, in the, like in this discussion, all of our actors to, to, to take all of our knowledge uh, at the best. So we, we, we have the mandate uh, of, of ensuring development for, for people living in poverty. Uh, and uh, Veronica and uh, Lavaz and other companies, they have other mandates, uh, but we share the goal of the coffee sector. We want it to be uh, sustainable. We want it to, to be uh, uh, providing good living conditions for families all over the world. And uh, we cannot do this alone. Uh, we need uh, to be together. Thank you, Cecilia. Our second question says, what role plays the local government in climate adaptation and how does CNC chip in? I'll leave this question openly to anyone who would like to answer. Then I will jump in here. Yes, of course, um, for us working with the local government in our program region is of course important because we also want to work together with them to shape, for example, national climate policy or cl climate framework, right? But we also want to provide and support local government extension staff so that they also can incorporate our knowledge into their own structures and then provide training to their communities, to their families. So working with the local government is of course, um, very important for us. Okay, Stefan, thank you. And as a final question to you, you mentioned that CNC will develop a framework for carbon accounting. Can you elaborate a bit more on this framework and how it will create benefits for farmers, please? Mm -hmm. So as I mentioned that right now, when we go to the coffee shop or to a supermarket and buy or coffee, then the price of the coffee does not reflect the true price of production. All the environmental and social aspects are not incorporated into this price. And we believe that farming families should receive a financial incentive, right, for maintaining good soil, for maintaining local forest areas, etc. And therefore, within Coffee and Climate, in the next program phase, we will evaluate how we can develop a carbon mechanism, a carbon framework that benefits smallholder families by providing incentives for maintaining these areas, but at the same time providing the, the opportunity for the industry to establish carbon um, neutral supply chains. So it's a process we have started by assessing, evaluating um, which kind of steps can be taken, and we will start with that then in this program phase. 
Thank you. As much as we would like um, to answer all of your questions, our time is coming up to an end. But before we finalize the webinar, I'd like to give our panelists the opportunity to briefly share their thoughts on the value of cooperation within coffee and climate. So CNC wishes to build a climate smart coffee sector, not by talking, but by acting. Why would you recommend joining the CNC approach to others and why? I'm going to give you approximately 20 seconds each, please. And Dulce, why don't you start? Off. Okay, yes, I've been part uh, of Coffee and Climate since 2018, and I have been able to see firsthand that approaches and we are implementing work. I've already seen the changes, and it's something long term. Thank you, Dulce. Veronica, how about you? I would just support what Dulce said. I had the opportunity to visit a Guatemala, the Guatemala community of coffee and climate two years ago. And I saw what Dulce is saying, the, 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 uh, the involvement first hand of farmers. And that is what I like very much about coffee and climate. Cecilia, final thoughts? I would uh, subscribe to that too. That is the real value of coffee and climate. Uh, but we have said it so many times, but it, it, is, it is a key takeaway that the true partnerships where we all listen and we all contribute with our best knowledge, that is what makes this initiative unique uh, and, and really delivers on the ground. Stefan, 20 seconds. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what makes it for me unique of in climate is that we have the research and knowledge part, we have the direct training in the field part, and we also have the sharing of knowledge. So all the three components, which I think make coffee and climate unique in the sector. And also the initiative is a platform where supply chain partners can come together and exchange learnings, experiences, discuss what are best approaches. So that makes it as a unique platform for me in the coffee sector. And more partners are invited to join, of course. So it's open, it's pretty competitive, and we can also organize great webinars. So, <laughs> thank you, Stefan. Um, we'd like to thank all of you, our panelists, and everyone for joining us today. We really hope you enjoyed the webinar. Uh, we'll be sending a follow up email before the end of the week. Um, with the link to the webinar recording and answers to questions that were not answered during the webinar. And in the meantime, if you would like more information on CNC, make sure to visit the website and subscribe to our newsletter so you can receive updates on the new phase. And having that said, we will officially end the webinar now. We hope you have a wonderful day. Be well and stay safe. Goodbye, everyone.